These lashes are giving the most. Hello folks, welcome back to my channel. I started off doing a, wanting to do like a very orange, fall toned Halloween eye look and then I put these lashes on and suddenly I was giving like 1920s vintage doll. I'm not mad about it. Today I'm going to be doing my bi-monthly book haul. I'm going to be talking about all the books I acquired in September and October. Got a couple of books I got off of Pango. Um, first off we've got Gear Breakers by Zoe Hana Mikuta. The only way to kill a god is from the inside. Anyway, Zoe Hana Mikuta currently attends the University of Washington, Seattle. Grew up in Boulder, Colorado. Deep love of Muay Thai kickboxing. Fuck yeah. Um, Alright, so Gear Breakers. I'm probably gonna just read the synopses of most of these because... I buy a, I know a, I know I want a book, but can I tell you why? Not until I reread the synopses. Like I don't I don't keep that kind of compact coherentness in my brain. We went past praying to deities and started to build them instead. The shadow of Godolia's tyrannical rule is spreading, aided by their giant mechanized weapons known as wind-ups. War and oppression are everyday constants for the people of the Badlands who live under the thumb of their crew Godolia overlords. Erish and Danai is a gear breaker, a brash young rebel who specializes in taking down wind-ups from the inside. When one of her missions goes awry, she finds herself in a Godolia prison. Eris meets Sonia Steelcrest, a cybernetically enhanced wind-up pilot. At first, Eris sees Sona as her mortal enemy, but she soon discovers Sona has a secret. She has intentionally infiltrated the wind-up pilot program in order to destroy Godolia from within. As the clock ticks closer to their deadliest mission yet, a direct attack to end Godolia's reign once and for all, Eris and Sona grow closer as well as comrades, friends, and perhaps something more. So, anyway, a couple of badass people taking down giant mechs. I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Um, then I also got, finally got, take a hint, Danny Brown. This is the second book in the Brown Sisters <laughs> trilogy. Um, I've been saying I need to read the rest of this trilogy for two years. <laughs> two years, ever since I read the first one. This is book two. Um, it's got a, a fake dating trope, I believe. Danica Brown knows what she wants. Professional success, academic renown, and an occasional roll in the hay to relieve all that career-driven tension. But romance? Been there, done that, burned the t-shirt. Romantic partners, whatever their gender, are a distraction at best and a drain at worst. So Danny asks the universe for the perfect friend with benefits, someone who knows the score and knows their way around the bedroom. When big brooding security guard Zafir Ansari rescues Danny from a workplace fire drill gone wrong, it's an obvious sign. PhD student Danny and former rugby player Zaf are destined to sleep together, but before she can explain that fact to him, a video of the heroic rescue goes viral. Suddenly, half the internet is shipping, hashtag Dr. Rug Rugby, <laughs> and Zaf is begging Danny to play along. Turns out his sports charity for kids could really use the publicity. Lying to help children. Who on earth could refuse? I love the, I love the little bit of snark her premises have. Danny's plan is simple, fake a relationship in public, seduce Zaf behind the scenes. The trouble is, grumpy Zaf is secretly a romantic, and he's determined to corrupt Danny's stone-cold realism. Before long, he's tackling her fears into the dirt, but the former sports star has issues of his own, and the walls around his heart are as thick as his, um, thighs. It literally says dot dot dot, um, thighs. Suddenly, the easy lay Danny dreamed of is more complex than her thesis. Has her wish backfired? Is her focus being tested? Or is the universe waiting for her to take a hint? My excitement is renewed. It's gonna be a fun time, of course. And the third book, which also looks like brand new and unread, A Snake Falls to Earth by Darcy Little Badger, which I will be, which is on my very short TBR for November, um... I'm sort of participating in the Skolden Readathon, which is kind of what's taking place instead of Indigathon. The uh, the hosts of Indigathon are not able to 
run that readathon this year, but Native Ladybook Warrior is running the Scolden readathon, which has very similar prompts to get you to read more Indigenous authored literature in November. Um, so I read Darcy Little Badger's, what's it called? Elatsoe a while ago. <laughs> Last year, probably. Um, and really enjoyed it. And then this is her more recent book to come out. And I'm excited. Nina is a leap end girl in our world. She's always felt there was something more out there. She still believes in the old stories. Oil is a cottonmouth kid from the land of spirits and monsters. Like all cottonmouths, he's been cast from home. He's found a new one on the banks of the bottomless lake. Nina and Ollie have no idea the other exists, but a, but a catastrophic event on Earth and a strange sickness that befalls Ollie's best friend will drive the worlds together in ways they haven't been in centuries, and some will kill to keep them apart. In A Snake Falls to Earth, Darcy Little Badger draws on traditional Lipa and Apache storytelling structure to weave another unforgettable tale of monsters, magic, and family. Yes. Lovely. Okay, then we've got a couple of ebook romance books that I've already read. First up is Exodus 23 by Freydis Moon. Let me just be consistent and read the synopses. Religious eroticism and queer emancipation meet in a claustrophobic monster romance about divinity, sexuality, and freedom. When Diego Lopez is guilted by his mother into taking a low-key construction job in New Mexico, he doesn't expect to be the only helping hand at Catedral de Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe, but the church is abandoned, decrepit, and off the beaten path, and the only other person for miles is its handsome t caretaker, Ariel Azevedo. Together, Diego and Ariel refurbish the old church, sharing stories of their heritage, experiences, and desires, but as the long days turn into longer nights, Diego begins to see past Ariel's human mirage and finds himself falling into lust and maybe something else with one of God's first creations. I have already read this. I enjoyed it. I will chat more about that whenever I get around to filming my October wrap-up. And then the other ebook I acquired this month is The Company of Fiends by Catherine Moon. Uh, this is the second book in the Temp Tempting Monsters series. The first book is uh, A Lady of Rooksgrave Manor. Um, have also already read this and it's excellent. I love it possibly even more than the first one. Um, all right. After eight years on the stage with the company of fiends, the glow of the spotlight is starting to wear thin for Hazel Nix. The theater is perfect for a girl like her, one with a secret she keeps even from her more monstrous peers. But playing pretend is only exciting for so long. After so many lovers on stage and otherwise, Hazel has yet to make a lasting connection with anyone and considers taking her last bow with the company. Just as Hazel encounters a new and intriguing patron, disaster strikes the theater. Girls are going missing and suspicious bad luck plagues the stage. Between ex-lovers, current bed partners, and new faces at the theater, Hazel's heart is tangled more than ever as she finds it increasingly, increasingly impossible to draw herself away from the life she's known for so long. It's time to make a choice, start fresh before she's drawn into the mess, or take a stand and fight for the family she's found in the strangest of places. Um, so I feel like that doesn't actually set you up for what's going on. So yes, uh, erotic monster romance, reverse harem, um, and compared to the first one, this one is much darker and more action-driven. We definitely still get lots of steamy playtime, um, but... Um, the mystery of what is happening to these girls and how it's connected to the theater is a huge plot driving aspect of the story. Um, and we def and it's definitely related to the villain that we eventually get around to in the first one. The first one takes its time setting up the villain story and this one takes that villain story and really runs with it. Just managing your expectations that don't like... It's still the same world and a lot of the same romance feelings as the first book, but tonally it's very different. Um, they're both good. I like them both. So then I have a couple of uh, E arcs from NetGalley. First off is Blood Debts by uh, Terry J. Benton Walker. So this synopsis is... 30 years ago, a young woman was murdered, a family was lynched, and New Orleans saw the greatest magical massacre in its history. In the days that followed, a throne was stolen from a queen. On the anniversary of these brutal events, Clement and Tristina Trudeau, the 16-year-old twin heirs to the powerful magical dethroned family, are mourning their father and caring for their sick mother. 
until by chance they, they discover their ma mother isn't sick, she's cursed. Cursed by someone on the very magic council their family used to rule, someone who will come for them next. Christina, once a talented and dedicated practi practitioner of generational magic, has given up magic for good. An ancient spell is what killed their father, and she was the one who cast it. For Clement, magic is his, is his lifeline, a distraction from his anger and pain, even better than the random guys he hooks up with. Christina and Clement used to be each other's most trusted confidant and friend. Now they barely speak, but if they have any hope of discovering who is coming after their family, they'll have to find a way to trust each other and their family's magic, all while solving the decades-old murder that sparked the still-rising tensions between the city's magical and non-magical communities. And if they don't succeed, New Orleans may see another massacre, or worse. I've seen a couple of other people have this on TBRs or sh show up in book halls, so it's on a couple of people's radar. Um, sounds in interesting. New Orleans magic? Here for it. And then the other one was actually an um, audiobook arc, and this is uh, Valley of Shadows by Rudy Ruiz. Um, and I and I have just finished reading it, and I did really enjoy it. Genre-wise, it's a little different than things I usually read, but, um, yeah. Um, and also this cover is gorgeous. Love it. Okay. Discrimination is evil, but evil does not discriminate. 1883 West Texas. In the vast desert, a gleaming river snakes beneath the blinding sun. When the Rio Grande shifts course, the Mexican city of Olvido is stranded on the northern side of the new border between the, the United States and Mexico. When a series of mysterious and horrific crimes grip the divided border town, a reclusive former Mexican lawman is lured out of retirement to restore order and save the lives of a growing number of abducted children. I feel like I should elaborate that the mysterious and horrific crimes are ritualistic murders that some of them are pretty graphic, just, you know, managing expectations here. In the face of skeptics and hostile Anglo settlers, the war weary Charo, Solitario Cisneros, struggles to overcome not only the evil forces that threaten his town, but also his own inner demons. He is burdened by the turbulent darkness of a mystical curse that has guided his lonely destiny until Onawa, a gifted and beautiful Apache Mexican seer, joins his mission and dares him to change the course of both their lives. Yeah, so this is a mystery. There's definitely thriller aspects because we are racing against the clock to save missing children and there's quite a lot of violence, um, but this also really deals with um, the tensions of the US-Mexico border. Um, we get a lot of flashbacks to Soledadio's past in um, the Mexican army. Um, so it's, it's interesting. It, it's interesting. I will talk about that. I'll, I'll elaborate on it more in my, um, I just said what it's called, my October wrap up. Um, but overall, it I, I liked it. Um, I like the audiobook for it. Um, yeah. October is interesting because I originally had the goal of let me try to not buy, let me not buy or acquire any books. I want to save money so I have more money in my monthly budget um, to spend when there's all of the big sales in November. Um, and also I feel like, you know, I, I, I have my eyes on my residual TBR for the end of the year and then my... TBR, my physical TBR for next year that I'm looking at is starting to get a little full. So I'm like, all right, let me just see how, if I can hit pause. And then I ended up acquiring eight books, you know, six of them. I didn't really choose the timing of when I acquired them. It's always fun when I type in the title of a NetGalley book into Goodreads and it just has no idea what this book is. I'm like, I know it hasn't come out yet, but like this book exists, I promise. Okay, first up we've got After Many a Summer by Tim Powers. A magisterial new novella from Tim Powers borrows its title from a line in Tennyson's famous poem, Tithonus, an elegaic appeal for death on the part of the titular figure from myth, a man who was granted the everlasting life he had originally begged from the gods, only to have their gift turned to ashes in his mouth, only, as Tennyson wrote, to begin someone whom only cruel immortality consumes. What does this have to do with homelessness, troubled movie production companies, kidnapped heiresses, prophecies delivered by taxidermied heads, and a Los Angeles County rendered with such massive lived in bone deep attention to physical detail that to read the opening is to feel the heat from cracked asphalt rising through your shoes and to, 
taste cheap fortified wine grown warm in the sun cloying your tongue. Can all these seemingly disparate things be connected, cohered, clarified? This is a Tim Power story. Of course they can. Conrad is a down-on-his-luck screenwriter who takes a very strange assignment that leads him to encounter a kidnapped heiress after delivering her ransom, a hundred-year-old mummified head fond of cryptic utterances. Nothing goes Conrad's way, though, because nothing, no matter how bizarre, is what it seems. Ambitious, surreal, weird... Covers giving me weird mannequin horror vibes. Alright. And then, this was actually not from NetGalley, this was from, this was um, free through a tor.com email. Um, this is The Empress of Salt and Fortune by Niveau. This is the first novella in the Singing Hills cycle. A young royal from the far north is sent south for a political marriage in an empire reminiscent of imperial China. Her brothers are dead, her armies and their war mammoths long defeated and caged behind their borders. Alone and sometimes reviled, she must choose her allies carefully. Rabbit, a handmaiden, sold by her parents to the palace for the lack of five baskets of dye, befriends the emperor's lonely new wife and gets more than she bargained for. At once feminist high fantasy and an indictment of monarchy, this evocative debut follows the rise of the Empress Inyo, who has few resources and fewer friends. She's a northern daughter in a mage made in a mage made summer exile, but she will bend history to her will and bring down enemies piece by piece. This is something that's been on my radar for a while. I've seen quite a few people uh, read through the cycle and really enjoy it. So thanks, door.com. Okay, then I've got a uh, song of silver, flame like night. I should say, uh, I should say what a lot since a lot of these are arcs. I should say when they're published, and since I'm halfway through it already, I'm just gonna put that in the description box. Here we are, 20, 20 some minutes in, and I'm only mentioning this. I will have all the author titles, authors, and other details such as publication date in the description box below if you would like to go back and reference it. Okay, next we've got Song of Silver, Flame Like Night by Amelie Wen Zhao. All right, in a fallen kingdom, one girl carries the key to discovering the secrets of her nation's past and unleashing the demons that sleep at its heart, an epic fantasy series inspired by the mythology and folklore of ancient China. Once Lan had a different name. Now she goes by the one the Atlantean colonizers gave her when they invaded her kingdom, killed her mother, and outlawed her people's magic. She spends her nights as a song girl in Hakong, a city transformed by the conquerors and her days scavenging for what she can find of the past. Anything to understand the strange mark burnt into her arm by her mother in her last act before she died. The mark is mysterious, an untranslatable hidden character, and no one but Lan can see it until the night a boy appears at her tea house and saves her life. Zhen is a pr practitioner, one of the fabled magicians of the Last Kingdom. Their magic was rumored to have been drawn from the demons they communed with, magic believed to be long lost. Now it must be hidden from the Atlanteans at all costs. When Zhen comes across Lan, he recognizes what she is, a practitioner with a powerful ability hidden in the mark on her arm. He's never seen anything like it, but he knows that if there are answers, they lie deep in the pine forest and misty mountains of the Last Kingdom, with an order of practitioning masters planning to overthrow the Atlant Atlantean regime. Both Lan and Zhen have secrets buried deep within, secrets they must hide from others, and secrets that they themselves have yet to discover. Fate has connected them, but their destiny remains unwritten. Both hold the power to liberate their land, and both hold the power to destroy the world. That sounds epic, and I'm here for it. Then we have an audiobook that I've already listened to and will chat about more in my October wrap-up. This is The Empress of Time by Kylie Lee Baker. This is the uh, sequel to... what's it called? The Keeper of Night. Let's see. So this is book two. So there might be a little bit of spoilers for the ending of book one. So basically, if you want to skip ahead, skip to where the cover is no longer on the screen. Um, Ren Scarborough is no longer the girl who was chased out of England. She is the goddess of death, ruling Japan's underworld. But reapers have recently been spotted in Japan, and it's only a matter of time before Ivy, now Britain's death goddess, comes to claim her revenge. Ren's last hope is to appeal to the god of storms and seas who can turn the tides and send Ivy's ships away from Japan's shores. 
but he'll only help Ren if she finds a sword lost thousands of years ago, an impossible demand. Together with the moon god Tsukuyomi, Ren ventures across the country in a race against time. As her journey thrusts her in the middle of shimin gods and dangerous yokai demons, she will have to learn who she can truly trust, and the fate of Japan hangs in the balance. Uh, like I said, I've already listened to it, and I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I think it's a solid duology. Next we have uh, City of Nightmares by Reje Re Rejecca. Mm -mm. Next we have City of Nightmares by Rebecca Schaefer. It's kind of summarized as Gotham meets Strange the Dreamer. Two pieces of media that I have not, that I know very little about. Ever since her sister became a man-eating spider and slaughtered her way through town, an 18-year-old Ness has been terrified. Terrified of some other nightmare murdering her and terrified of ending up like her sister. Because in Newham, the city that never sleeps, dreaming makes, means waking up as your worst fear. Whether that means becoming a nightmare that's monstrous only in appearance, to transforming into a twisted, unrecognizable creature that terrorizes the city, no one is safe. Ness will do anything to avoid becoming another victim, even if that means lying low among the friends of the Restful Soul, a questionable organization that may or may not be a cult. But, but being a member of Maybe Cult has a price. Tangled up in the aftermath of an explosive assassination, now Ness and the only other survivor, a nightmare boy who Ness suspects is planning to eat her, must find their way back to Newham and discover the sinister truth behind the attack even as the horrors of her past loom ominously near. I mean, anything with like dream or like nightmare magic. I'm, I am intrigued. I'm intrigued, definitely. Okay, what next? Now we've got The Cherished by Patricia Ward, which this cover, ooh, it is both elegant, lovely, and unsettling. Jo never expected to be placed in her absent grandmother's will, let, al let alone be left her house, her land, and a letter with mysterious demands. Upon arriving at the inherited property, things are even more strange. The tenants mentioned in the letter are odd, just slightly off. Jo feels something dark and decrepit in the old shack behind the house, and the things that her father used to talk about, his delusions, why is Jo starting to believe they might be real? But what Joe feels fears most is the letter from her grandmother, because if it's true, then Joe belongs here, in this strange place, and she has no choice but to stay. With a deadly enemy that cannot be seen, a world that may only be unlocked by a chosen few, and a chilling past that must be unearthed at any cost, the Cherish is an original, hypnotizing contemporary horror, one, w one that will thrill readers of White Smoke, Walder Girls, and The Hazelwood. We, we love us a spooky house. Okay. And that's it for the the digital books I acquired. Um, then, from uh, a little independent bookstore in my neighborhood, I found a copy of The Feather Thief by Kirk Wallace Johnson, Beauty, Obsession, and the Natural History Heist of the Century. A rollicking true crime adventure and a captivating journey into an underground world of fanatical fly tires and plume peddlers. On a cool June evening in 2009, after performing a concert at London's Royal Academy of Music, 20-year-old American flautist Edwin Rist boarded a train for a suburban outpost of the British Museum of Natural History. Home to one of the largest ornithological collections in the world, the train museum was full of rare bird specimens whose gorgeous feathers were worth staggering amounts of money to the men who shared Edwin's obsession, the Victorian art of salmon fly tying. Once inside the museum, Edwin grabbed hundreds of bird skins, some collected 150 years earlier, and escaped into the darkness. What would possess a person to steal dead birds? What became of Edwin and the missing skins? The gripping story of a bizarre and shocking crime, The Feather Thief is a fascinating exploration of obsession and a man's destructive instinct to harvest the beauty of nature. So we've got nature collecting, museum heist, Mysterious Culprit. Okay, okay. And the last book, probably the crown jewel of the book collecting of the past couple of months. Uh, we have Goliath by Tochi Onibuchi. Uh, I found this second hand. This is another one that, looking at the spine, it looks 
uh, not just like in good condition, but pristine and unread. And, and it's signed. If this is something that's been on my radar for a while, it's gotten rave reviews. Um, I am, I am, yes, lovely. From Hugo Nebula Locus and AACP Image Award finalist and Alex and New England Book Award winner Tochi Onyebuchi. In the 2050s, Earth has begun to empty. Those with the means and the privilege have departed the great cities of the United States for the more comfortable confines of space colonies. Those left behind salvage what they can from the collapsing infrastructure. As they eke out an existence, their neighborhoods are being cannibalized. Brick by brick, their houses are sent to the colonies, what was once a home, now a quaint reminder for the colonists of the world that they wrecked. A primal biblical epic flung into the future, Goliath weaves together disparate narratives, a space dweller looking at New Haven, Connecticut as a chance to reconnect with a spiraling lover, a group of laborers attempting to renew the promise of Earth's crumbling cities, a journalist attempting to capture the violence in the streets, a marshal trying to solve a kidnapping, into a richly urgent mosaic about race, class, gentrification, and who is allowed to be the hero of any story. So, um, I believe it's a thought-provoking literary science fiction. As much as I love action science fiction, I also love, like, thoughtful literary science fiction that uses the speculative to really crack open these issues and make you think about them, so... Yes. Those are the books. I'm excited. I've already read three of them, so that feels manageable. Great. Okay. Let me know if you have also read any of these books, if any of these are on your radar, and you are also excited for them. If you've made it this far, can you leave me a feather or a bird emoji? Just to let me know you're here. Um, yeah. I hope you have a good rest of your day. I encourage you to go out into the world and be curious. I will leave my social media and other places where you can find me in the description box below. And I will catch you folks in my next video. Bye.